Welcome to uh, wonderful Las Vegas, guys. We are at the world headquarters of GoHunt.com. On my left is Brady Miller. On my right, Trail. What's the proper pronunciation? Kreitzer. Kreitzer. That's what I thought. My name is Butcher a lot, so I have a little yeah. bit of respect there. Yeah. Uh, anyways, guys, we are going to be answering questions. Some of you, a lot of you, submitted uh, a variety of questions related to strategy, draw odds, how do I get started hunting out west, elk or mule deer? What kind of gear should I use? How should I approach a particular situation I'm hunting? So a whole bunch of different topics. Brady and Trail are very experienced, uh, not only in backcountry hunting for mule deer and elk, but also very, very experienced within uh, different types of gear, setups, and you name it. I think they're both tinkers from what I can see. They are probably way more technically advanced than we are when it comes to making the right choices for gear. So we're just gonna bounce through a ton of questions and um, Hopefully, you guys will find it valuable. All right, we're also going to be doing right now a little giveaway with us. We're going to be giving away five $500 gift cards for signing up for our 30 day free trial of the Insider. So, if you've never tried out Insider before, you want to check it out, this is the time to do it right now. So, the month of August, if you sign up, goman.com slash hush is the URL you need to check it out. Sign up for a 30 day free trial, to get entered to win. Cool there is a ton of cool stuff in there. So yeah, make sure you just check it out. We'll put a link in the description box and uh, make sure you get entered to win. We'll be announcing the winners probably right around the first week of September. Okay, so uh, here's a good question that we can kick things off with. So this comes from Alex Bauer and it says, the tag I drew this year in Colorado is very hunter heavy unit. So how can I stay ahead of the pressure and increase my odds of being successful? I already plan on doing some hiking and can I hopefully stay away from the truck hunters but with elk and deer uh, already used to the heavy pressure, what can I do to make uh, sure that I'm not eating tag soup? Who wants to tackle this one first? I'll just throw in like a quick tip is just to stay persistent and hunt midday. A lot of people are out in the mornings, they glass, they don't see anything, they head back to camp to get a snack, take a nap, eat lunch. If you can just stay persistent and hunt through midday, I think you'll increase your odds big time. There's a lot of times when you actually might see an animal in the morning it's moving towards cover at a distance that you can't make a play on. I've seen a ton of guys just like, oh, I'm gonna head back to camp. You know, I'm not gonna make a play on it. You know, put yourself in a position like where if that buck gets up midday or a bull moves that you're still in a position that you can make a move on it. And then, I mean, there's deer will be, you know, they'll second bed, they'll get up, they'll yeah. bed, they'll re-bed. You'll pick up an animal sometimes midday that you wouldn't otherwise if you're in campaign out. I think the biggest key too is just staying positive. Yeah. can't get discouraged if you see a truck or if you see somebody on another ridge. So much of it is timing, persistence, and I think a little bit of luck. And the more that you can just keep a positive hunting attitude, Very I think the better chances you have. We call it, it We call it PHA, positive hunting attitude. Just rolling off what Eric said, you know, first time I ever hunted Colorado, Eric took me over and we were non-residents, so we had to draw through the draw system, which was a fairly easy draw. Uh, we drew with zero points, it was a third season tag. And I was super excited because Eric had hunted it the year before. He had a lot of success, and so I thought we were gonna go over and see deer everywhere. Well, we got over there, I think, two days early, and we started glassing and scouting, and it looked just like any general season hunt I'd ever been in in Idaho and Utah. I was like, bro, this was like a draw hunt. Why are all those people? And I kind of got discouraged. I lost my PHA. But we hunted hard, and what we figured out is we were willing to do just a little more than most guys that were out there. And because we did that, we had a lot of success. We saw a lot of mature animals. So don't get discouraged if you do see a lot of people. Just work harder than them. Do Be willing to do a little more than most guys are, and I think you'll have a lot of success that way. Yeah, don't talk yourself out of a hunt before you even get there, right? Like, mm -hmm. you're driving up a main road and you're seeing camps. I mean, it's just part of the business. Mm -hmm. Don't talk yourself out of it before you even give it a go, right? Yeah. So next one comes from Chris Olson. He's from North Carolina, and he's gonna be flying out to elk hunt in Idaho. His question is, what's the best way to get the elk meat, the hide, and the antlers back to the East Coast? So I think that's a very valid question for anybody that's traveling via airplane from uh, one coast to the nuts, or frankly, even just coming from, let's say, Salt Lake to Albuquerque, which we've done several times. We've taken it to a processor and had it shipped out frozen. Again, small deer, axis deer in Texas, and we've had great luck doing it that way, but an elk, I don't know, I guess you just pay for more shipping. 
could probably do the same thing. If you're flying, it's most likely best to take it to a local processor and uh, just make sure that they'll ship it for you frozen. Going off that, it comes down to logistics. Uh, why, why are you flying out there? I know that's a long drive, but is it to save a couple days working, save some money, whatever it might be, but figure out your logistics. If you do drive, it's gonna take you more time. The freight coming home is gonna be free because you're gonna throw it in the back of your truck. My suggestion would be fly out there, pay a little extra money, get home early, go to work so you can pay for your freight. I mean, for elk, I don't know, I've, I've flown deer back and meat from like Kodiak, and typically there we just freeze it and then pack it in a box and, and pay for the extra packaging and shipping costs on an airplane. Mm -hmm. You stick the head. Check it. Your, yeah, check it, mm -hmm. yeah, and then just stick the head in my backpack. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I had a New Mexico Gila elk tag, killed a bull, and flew it from Albuquerque to Portland, Oregon. So we went and just bought cheap coolers at Walmart, threw some dry ice in there. The cape was in its own cooler, and then we had to uh, take the skull plate in the rack, wrap it with a cut pieces of hose on each time, duct tape those on, and then we basically put a support beam across the uh, antlers and shrink wrap the whole thing. So you're going to experience exorbitant amounts of cost, whether you take it on the plane with you or whether you ship it from a butcher. A lot of different options there, but you're looking at some added cost no matter what. Or I can just save all the problems with you right now. You're coming to Idaho, swing by my house in Pocatello, <laughs> drop all your meat off, I will consume it with my family, and you won't have to worry about any of this. <laughs> so this question comes from Bryce. Can you walk us through what you look for on Go Hunt or Maps for a new elk or deer hunt? Either one of you guys should definitely lead off on this one. Yeah, so for me, I'm just gonna pull up the state of Idaho, pick the species if it's elk, I'm gonna pick that. I'm assuming that you're maybe looking at an over-the-counter type of hunt or an easy draw hunt. And typically, I'll start first with draw odds and just click on the standalone draw odds and just start cruising those and seeing what your chances are for different areas. If you're looking for like an over-the-counter hunt, um, typically what I'll do is I'll pull up Idaho and filtering 2.0. I'll scroll down to the select season drop down uh, and at that point when you select that you can look at the different over-the-counter options so you can look at over-the-counter archery over-the-counter rifle um, you just click on that button you're only going to see the units that have that type of hunting available the next thing i do is i'm going to look at harvest success so i'm going to start sliding that slider over and start to look at harvest success i might start looking at percentage of public land so on harvest success what percentage is kind of like your bottom line that you look at um I mean, I just kind of want to get familiar with what's out there. If there's a high harvest success area or success area, I kind of might click on that unit and start seeing like, you know, what's that unit all about, checking the terrain, the vegetation, the access, um, those types of things, just to see you know, what the elk herd's like. Pretty soon you start digging through that, it'll paint a picture of, okay, maybe I've got two or three units here that are really interesting to me. I think going off that though is very important is, like you said, is to check the how much public land is in that mm -hmm. unit, but also check what, how much of that public land is accessible. So there'll be a lot of public land that might not be accessible except for maybe one or two trailheads. So I, that's always something I look at when I look at public land yeah. in, in a certain unit. Mm -hmm. Sort function a lot, sort by bow cow ratio, sort by buck doe ratio, sort by harvest success. So I can instantly see a good picture of, okay, these are the top trending units. Might have the most pressure, but also if I'm just looking to go out there and harvest a deer, and I just want to have a good hunting experience. I might want to go to one of those units that has a lot of harvest success with a lot of you know buck doe ratio. So then I know I'm going to have a great chance to harvest a deer, great chance to harvest a possibly a good buck, and they can also sort then by you know percent four point or better. So I have a higher chance to find a mature buck, and all those things just add to my success right away to cut down that research time to actually find a little hunting area and then dive into maps, start researching. Like that's where it's starts to get fun. Let's see it. Okay, so next one comes from Dallin Williams. What broadheads do you guys prefer? Fixed or mechanical? What brands do you lean towards? Eric, you want to start? The two broadheads I shoot, I shoot both mechanical and fixed. My mechanical blade is a sever broadhead. My fixed blade is a four blade slick trick. And honestly, I started shooting those because they're one at the archery shop at the time that was legal in the state of Idaho. So one thing you want to look into is also the regulations of the state you're hunting. I tend to lean towards a fixed blade for elk, and I kind of use my mechanicals for small game like axis deer, whitetail, and mule deer. Kind of, kind of the same thing. I do use mechanicals, but I also use fixed blades. Like mm -hmm. I'm with moose hunting, I have fixed blade, but most of my other stuff I just hunt deer, so it's always you know mechanical. I use a rich uh, new tripan. 
There's a billion broadheads out there right now. I mean, there's so many broadheads. It's like um, ammunition, right? Yeah, I mean, there's some really good mechanicals. There's some really good fixed blade heads. Uh, I tend to lean towards, you know, hunting with a fixed blade for elk. The one thing you hear about mechanicals is like, oh, they fly with your field tips, which is great. So if your guy doesn't like to tinker, uh, you know, they can be great. They do cut a big hole. If your guy likes to tinker, you can tune a bow. Um, you know, I, I don't see any reason not to shoot a fixed blade. Well, yeah, I think that's the biggest thing, and especially when, it, when Expandables came out on the market in the first place, that was the big push was mm -hmm. they fly just like your field point. But like Trey was saying, if you know a little bit about bows and, and how to tune them, you can tune a bow, and especially with the new, new fixed blade broadheads. There's a lot of broadheads out on the market that fly very identical mm -hmm. to your field point. But I think it just comes down to experience. You know, I've had bad experiences with both, and uh, but I would say that, like Eric said, for mule deer, I'll be shooting a, an expandable sever this year. But for elk, I'll definitely always shoot a fixed blade. If your bow's tuned good, you, you should be able to shoot a fixed blade broadhead fairly accurately. So, anyways, fantastic question. That's uh, one like kind of like boots. A lot of personal preferences on oh, yeah. broadheads. Okay, so next question comes from Dean Baldwin. This is just timed perfectly because we are all uh, jonesing for some high country mule deer. What should I look for when scouting for high country mule deer? He's talking about Utah specifically, but I think across the board, we could all agree that it's gonna be fairly similar. Let's just take a look at behind us. <laughs> if I was looking for high country mule deer country, this is what I'd look for. Big high basins, open, got some uh, cover in there, right? You need cover, cover's probably one of the biggest things on hunting alpine mule deer. Yeah. I have a question for you that goes off, off this. Where we hunt in Utah is a high country high country unit, mm -hmm. we can't ever find water. How important is water to deer early in the season? Honestly, in the high country stuff, a lot of the deer is getting from the vegetation. Mm -hmm. So like, I never really pay attention. Like, hey, I need to be within a mile or two miles of a water source. Like, deer are amazing animals and they get a lot of it. So, so they obtain the moisture they need just through the vegetation yeah, in the morning? Think, through yeah, the yeah, dew. Yeah, the, the dew every morning. Like, the you know, vegetation and the dew. Yeah, I was gonna say the dew, the morning dew. It's kind of what we've come up with over the years, not ever finding water and there's deer there yeah. all the time. When scouting, it's like I always say, you find the groceries, you find the deer, and if you're yeah. securing next to it, that's where you're going to have the bucks. So diving into his logistical challenge of being 17 hours away, you may not have much time to scout, maybe a day or two before season. That late into getting ready for the hunt, would you change tactics at all, or would you do the same thing? I think spend tons of time on Google Earth, just cruising those high mountain basins and looking. I mean, I think Casey's right, it's this type of stuff you're looking for. You're looking for a nice mosaic of feeding and, you know, cover areas where you get stringers of pine. Um, you can spend a ton of time and actually learn a ton just by cruising maps and Google Earth and have a pretty good idea where so, you're going to find deer. Outside of Google Earth, which is an awesome feature, mm -hmm. what map layer would you guys say you use the most? The satellite feature, or topo feature, maybe a hybrid? I, I use a hybrid a lot. I'll take the topo, trying to find, you know, maybe some areas I can access a little saddle that's coming over where deer might be pushing into for pressure, and then I'll jump over to satellite and comparing this, the history of the slider mainly, so I want to see, like, okay, this is the green vegetation this time of year. Uh, this one kind of, like, ties yeah. in into the what we are just talking about on top, top of maps and just e-scouting in general, but Adam Gutierrez wants to know, he's from Texas, a flatlander, does a lot of e-scouting, but is interested within top of maps. How do you all go about choosing the best route to an area, be it ridges, drainages, saddles, like you mentioned? If you're looking online, e-scouting, how do you map out your route? And do you oftentimes map out your map on Google Earth ahead of time? Here's how I'm going to get up there. I think that's essential because I hate hiking through nasty timber or brush. I'll use that satellite layer and I'll dive in as close as I can, zoom in as close as I can to the bottom, figure out what that terrain is, and then try to navigate a way to move around through it. So I don't have to go through a bunch of oak brush and get like basically brushed out where you can't crawl, crawl yeah. through it anymore. But yeah. I'd rather just get in the open so I can go fast and use a long leg as I have to just push through terrain. I think a lot of people would trend to go the flat, easy route versus. Um, you know, a steeper route, but when you factor in some of the vegetation we see out west, a lot of times those oak and buck brush, I mean, they're chest high, it can be brutal to hike through, so super good tip. So next one comes from Stuart Kelly. He's uh, from Texas. He is interested in finding out if there's any over-the-counter tags for non-residents in states like Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, Utah, Wyoming, Idaho, Oregon, Washington, Montana. So pretty much the west. all of the west. We're gonna call this a segue, Stuart. What would be the best way to figure that stuff out, guys? 
If you're not a Go On Insider, if you could become one, that's a great tool to find those opportunities. Uh, and once you are an insider, you log into your account, all that stuff's really uh, accessible to you. And we're going to cover that probably in an application strategy article or a strategy article for every given state and species. Uh, so you'd be able to pull up that article and instantly see if that's a an opportunity to pick up an over-the-counter tag, jump into filtering 2.0 and pick up a state, pick up you know the select season filter and just look to see because it's immediately going to identify which uh, hunts are available over the counter. We talked about this a lot you know we haven't been the luckiest in yeah. the last few years and and some of the most success we have are on over-the-counter tags that we've hunted year after year and year after year and that's what's great about an over-the-counter tag is you're not looking out just go out there one time and have a good time and come home but you can actually hunt that unit every year and get to know it better and better every year and learn more information about it if you guys want to watch a video about me talking about no over-the-counter um, opportunities in idaho uh, running through the 2.0 system on the insider well, we'll leave a link in the description because i just did a video a couple weeks ago talking about the same thing yeah it's kind of funny we just got back from north dakota and talking to the residents out there it's it's a once in a lifetime draw to hunt elk in north dakota and so everyone puts elk on that high pedestal and i just kind of giggled to myself i'm like i'm sitting on three elk tags over the counter tag. So the Utah open bowl you can get over the counter, over the counter in Idaho and Colorado. So the question that a lot of people are asking right around draw results is everyone's, hey did you draw any good tags? And my first answer is no, but I have a pocket full of over the counter tags that I look forward to every single year. So yeah, there is a ton of opportunity out there. It's very overwhelming to try to figure out where to start. In the past you had to go search out every single state's website compile it all on your own spreadsheets or notebooks if you're into that. Maybe you <laughs> like me, picked up a magazine article back in the day and now like that's what's so beautiful about the Go Hunt Insider application. Everything is right there at your fingertips. They continue to add new states year after year, but you can legitimately hunt elk or deer every single year as long as you have the tools and the resources to figure out where. Look at Filtering 2.0. Make sure you sign up for the, three, the 30 day free trial go into filtering 2.0, you'll be able to select as a non-resident, and in those different states, you can see automatically, it'll say over the counter tag. You can just kind of see what you're looking for, whether it be archery or rifle. So tons of resources, but uh, Stuart, to answer your question, absolutely, there's a bunch of tags in those states that you mentioned, and so hopefully that helps you out. Okay, so next one, this is a hot topic because it just was released, it comes from Dan Merchant. The Colorado leftover over the counter tags just got released online. What are the top five or 10 public land tags folks should try and pick up? Now, Dan, without giving away the goods, probably not gonna give you, uh, here's the units you should go get picked up, but instead, what could you look for to help you determine of those available tags, which ones might be great for you if you're looking for mature mule deer or maybe your mature elk? This is, comes from years of trying to pick up over, over these tags that like are left, you know, they're not left over, but they're turned back tags. So people have turned the tag back in. The first rush, first come, first serve, everybody's going to go for the top 10% of the tags. They're going to go for the best stuff. That's what everybody's trying to add to their cart and check out. Man, if you can find a hunt that's maybe not in that radar, it's below everybody else's kind of line of sight. Um, that can be a tag that you can pick up way easier than you know battling everybody for the top 10 tags. So maybe think about that. There's some great tags on there, but maybe don't think about the ones that are the top 10. Maybe do some research and see about the lower ends. That's all a guy needs is an opportunity, right? Yeah. Just pick up a tag and not worry if it's the greatest tag because likelihood is you're not going to get that tag. So there's a thousand other guys trying to grab that tag. So they kind of talked about it a little bit earlier, but again, if you were to pick your top two tools to look at. So you have this list of tags. Mm -hmm. we're, we're gonna eliminate that top 5% of elite tags because we don't think we're gonna get those. How do I, like, what are the key features within Insider that you're gonna key in on to help you make that decision you're talking about? For me, it's gonna be a lot of the strategy articles. I recently did right for the Colorado Draw an article on breaking down every single Colorado mule deer season. And how many hunters are hunting it? What's the pressure gonna be like? How to know, okay, is this gonna be a great season for me? but actually how many over-the-counter elk hunters are also going to be using at the same time, because that's another thing to look at when you're trying to find a mule share or kind of pull all that pressure. More pressure means, yeah, they might not be hunting deer, those elk guys are running around scaring up everything. Yeah. Okay, yeah. keep all that stuff in mind when you're trying to find a unit you want to apply to. So strategy articles to me, they're only available insiders that you can just dive into, and there's so much little hidden gems in there that you can pick up. Like, yeah, we make the top ones, look at those middle ones, because those yeah. are the ones you can hunt a lot more often than, you know, those dream tags. 
certainly if you haven't hunted Colorado before, you will, if you do, you will see a lot of blaze orange if you're on rifle season. There's people hunting does, bucks, cows, and bulls, all at the same time. So when you see those folks, they may not necessarily be chasing the animal you're looking for, but certainly they're gonna be creating an equal amount of pressure uh, no matter what, so that's a great tip. Third season public land is can be important, so I'd start tearing those apart and seeing like how much land is accessible uh, within that unit before you just go out and buy a turn back tag. There's some good tags on there. There it is. Good luck, hope you get a good one. Okay, next question comes from Alicia Russell. Uh, what gear do you guys consider as an essential and a must have on a back country backpack hunt, specifically for a beginner? I and mean, I can tell you from after last year of us going on our first true backpacking spike hunt, where we had camp on our backs every day, boots are super important. Your sleeping gear, your sleeping system is super important. Most importantly, the food that you're taking in with you. Because if you have terrible food, you're going to have a terrible time. So figure out some food that you're not going to get. What I've noticed is I had all this food that I it sounded good, but after eating it for five days, it was very monotonous. So I would recommend switching things up with your food because that can be, I think, a, a game changer. Uh, a good quality pack is super important because if it's not comfortable and you can't, you know, haul out an animal after you've harvested it, you're just going to struggle. Uh, I would say sleep system is super important because ultimately it's what's going to keep you alive when you get yourself in a real pinch. So we're talking uh, a good shelter, whether that's a tent or a tarp or a bivy. Uh, a good quality sleeping bag is going to keep you warm um, that matches the type of climate that you're hunting in. Like, if you're miserable and you can't sleep back there, I mean, you might as well be at home in bed anyway because you're not going to have any motivation to go hunt. Pillow's one of those things you're like, I can get away without a pillow. I'll use my, my jacket or something. Yep. If you're a pillow sleeper at home, get you a lightweight pillow and pack it in there with you. It's like, what, three, four ounces? You know, we have, have, I'm an ounce counter, counter. <laughs> and I've started taking a pillow because yeah, <laughs> yeah, we have those lightweight blow so We have yeah, these little right. Sea to Summit Helios Ultralights. Yeah. They're one ounce. One ounce. Mm -hmm. One point seven. Add one ounce, you'll sleep way better. I guess my, my biggest piece of advice is if you get some of these items, uh, set them up at your house, try them out, like go out and sleep on your pad if, if you can, you know, just is it going to be comfortable? Or maybe if you're thinking about taking a hammock, you know, make sure you're comfortable with a hammock. Eric loves sleeping on hammocks, but man, I can't get away with it. So I mean, those are my essentials too, is rest and recovery, so food and sleep. But uh, an extra battery for your rangefinder. Mm. And I should go with you on every hunt, but I've learned from experience. If you're in the back country and that thing is goes dead, it's a long ways back to the truck and back to town. So I started yeah. moving mine from my backpack to my pocket. Yeah, like, yeah. The worst time ever is how it's happened. Everybody's about to any range, oh, and you have nothing so going true. on. And it packs up on the mountain. Yeah, like it's maybe in a bottom harness. Yeah, bottom harness. Yeah. yeah. These Garmin Interreach Explorers, whether you're talking the Mini or the Explorer, they have the, the brand new 66i that has the full GPS and, and does everything. I mean, the peace of mind that you have in the backcountry to be able to like message your you know your family, it's got the SOS button, you can keep touch with friends and family. I mean, there's tons yeah. of added peace of mind in that little piece of gear. So, uh, Next question comes from Brandon Hacker. What tips do you guys have for a group of friends that want to start a hunting channel on YouTube? We do a lot of these talks and we talk about, uh, you know, business and doing something together with partnerships is you got to find out why you want to do it. So uh, discuss as a group what your message is, why you want to start it and what your goals are. If you can find yourself a really strong, clear message why it's important to start a YouTube channel and what you want to accomplish by doing it, uh, you, if you start with a strong why and you move forward doing it, no matter how fast or small you grow, you'll never fail at it. Yeah, I definitely agree on, on figuring out your why. If it's to become rich or famous, it's probably not the greatest why because it will be a slow burn. And if that's really the end all be all, uh, you're kind of missing the point. I tell people all the time, our why is to inspire and, and to help try to get other people out. We call it new hunter recruitment. So those are some of the reasons why we do it. But at the end of the day, if nothing ever came about this, I tell people this all the time, I think one of the coolest things is looking back on my dad's old hunting pictures of him and his brother or him and my grandpa hunting, and I think that's the coolest thing ever. So say no one ever watches any of your videos on YouTube, but one day your grandkids come across it and they see grandpa out hunting in the woods, I think that's pretty rad and that's enough reason for me to continue to do this just because 
maybe I'll inspire my grandkids later on in life to, to take up the outdoors and enjoy our public lands. I always think when people want to start a YouTube channel, like you have to have a passion of capturing and sharing. If, right. you, if you don't have that and you just want to hunt, yeah. that's never going to work. See, that's the boat I'm in. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I've had a camera since I was a kid. I'd love to share it going home and plugging those audio video cables in, whether I was sharing it with my parents or a couple of close friends. I wanted to show people what I was missing. Mm -hmm. So to go out and even shed hunt or even go on a hike and not film something just doesn't make sense. It doesn't exist in my world. Right. It'd almost be weird to do it with that. Yeah. I think the question like, is it easy like to go out and go hunting for a living and capture, you know, content? That's easy. But everything else that goes along with it, that when you actually start trying to run it as a business, if you're looking to do that, it's not easy. Like I have a family, I have four kids. Um, I try to spend as much time at home on the off season as I can, which has been great. Cause I'm there when the kids go to school. I'm there when the kids come home from school most of the time. That wasn't the case when I worked at the steel mill before I started doing this. But during the season, it's very hard. It's very hard on me. It's very hard on my wife. It's very hard on my kids. I have a very understanding wife. And she loves what I do. She loves that we're inspiring other people to get out and do that. So if you're looking at just going out and filming and just having fun with it, which I think that's how everyone should start doing it, is, yeah, it's easy to have fun with your friends. And you should always maintain that thought process of let's just go have fun. But when you do start trying to run into a business, it's a business. It's a job just like anything else. The only difference is we never check out of our job. We're fortunate enough to wake up every day and be passionate about, passionate enough about the work we do that it doesn't necessarily feel like work all the time. But without a doubt, I mean, bringing camera equipment, bringing extra people on hunts, you're going to have lower success of taking animals maybe than you would if you were on your own. And that's just the reality of it. Not the easiest road. It's not a fast road. So be patient and just. Again, like Eric said, if you if you love doing it for the right reasons, just, you got to just keep keep after it because it could take some time before you get to a point of where you feel maybe it's where it, um, you wanted it to be. How soon do you guys scout for deer or elk? How important is scouting? And do you have any basic tips or techniques with regards to scouting? <laughs> So what do you guys yeah. think? Yeah, I mean, because you can always go up early and just you get to a new unit. The unit's giant. You don't need to go back back in. Set yourself up to one small little spot. You want to look at the whole unit. So I like to do is just drive around the unit, figure out what the train looks like in every little spot, figure out how to access it, all the different you know points you could come in, plan A, plan B, plan C. Because you just you just dive in the back country right away and try to find a hunting spot. You're just setting yourself up for one little area. You know, look at the big picture of what the whole unit looks like. I'd say scout for the hunt that you have. Like if you're archery hunting mule deer, or you know maybe like in Utah we have the muzzleloader hunt that runs that last week of September, early October. I know that my time spent in the field scouting for that hunt from about July to that first week of October. You know if I find a buck, that buck's going to be pretty dang close to that area. So just going off of that, I'm not a big shed hunter myself, but Eric has really showed me a lot and taught me a lot the last, especially the last few years that. Eric's really scouting all year long because, you know, we go and hunt these spots. He goes out in the early summer, starts scouting these spots, then we hunt that spot. And then he goes and shed hunts that spot. And he has so much more knowledge of being out in the field that long of those animals and exactly like where they summer to where they winter, where they rut, than I do that, that doesn't shed hunt. And I, if you're looking at shed hunting, it's just going out and picking up antlers. That's one thing. But I think the way Eric looks at it is it's just a great scouting tool as he picks up antlers. You can scout early season, which, you know, whether you're just glassing like the high country for mule deer and velvet, but you still have an October hunt, or setting cameras through the summer months, those tools can at least give you an idea of what bucks or bulls, what caliber to expect on your hunt. They may not be where you're at, but it's still valuable information. So, I mean, I love scouting, and one thing that like me and Martin always talk about is when we're out of season, we like to get as close to the hunt as possible. And scouting is kind of that for us, so it's fun. And uh, you know, every little piece of information you can pick up can definitely help down the road. Somewhere. Even outside of the animal part of scouting, just learning the unit from like, what's the best access points, what roads that I thought were open on the map were actually gated off because there's some private intersects there. What does the topography look like? Where's a good place that we could camp potentially? There's a lot of other dynamics that could go into it. The more time you can spend out there, the better off you're going to be. And uh, hopefully that, that helped out. Thanks for the question. Okay, so 
A couple more questions, we'll wrap this up. Hope you guys have enjoyed the video so far. This one comes from our YouTube community tab. If you guys didn't know, there's an actual community tab on our YouTube channel, a place we can post questions and different variety of polls and such, so go check that out. But it comes from Parker Krauss. Uh, would love to hear about your guys' archery setups. Should be a good diverse mix of setups here. You go, Case. I'm shooting the Hoyt RX3 Carbon yeah. this year. I'm shooting the Easton Axis 5mm for arrows with hush veins and wraps. You guys can get them at gethush.com. Plug. I'm shooting the Black Gold Verdict side. And I just switched over to a thumb release this year, which I'm really enjoying. I'm shooting the True Ball Thing 4. I'm shooting a Matthews Halon X, which would be the fifth year I think I've been shooting that bow, but it's a little longer axle axle, which I like it. I got long arms. An Excel AccuStat 5 pin slider sight, Trophy Taker Smackdown Pro Rest, Gold Tip, uh, Platinum Pierce Arrows, B Stinger Stabilizers, Front Bar, Back Bar. Um, and Release, I'm still shooting a True Ball HT Pro Hinge. I was way more in depth than I'm gonna be. <laughs> I'm shooting the same setup as Casey, essentially. The only difference really is I'm shooting the Carter Quickie release, uh, which is a wrist. And uh, I don't know, for me, I've just always enjoyed that. And so far, I'm feeling super confident. My broadhead choice might be a little bit different than Casey's. I think he shoots the Exodus as well, but I'm going to go with the four blade slick trick and then probably use that for my L tag and then for my pronghorn and my mule deer tag. Potentially we'll use the Sever 1.5, which is a newer, and those are both 125 grain broadheads when, I, when I'm going with. All right, I'm rocking the Matthews Traverse this year. I have a 32 inch draw length, so it's kind of tough for me to get some arrows that fit it. So I have a 250 spine, uh, Black Eagle X Impact arrows, a Fire Knock Outsert, I really like Outsert, so I'll punch a little bigger hole in animals. Uh, I've just switched to the Spot Hog Fast Daddy Double XL, the, the double pin. After elk hunting last year with a single pin, I kind of realized, hey, if I want to go elk hunting again, I'm going to need something yeah. Yeah. a little different for that setup. <laughs> but then it's got a hamski drop away rest attached to the lower limb. And I rock four fletch right now, but I'm definitely thinking about switching to six fletch. I've been trying to test that out quite a bit. Interesting. I just hate fletching them. Yeah. It's literally the worst yeah. thing in the world. Yeah. But the performance I get with mechanical and a six fletch. I really like it. Interesting. So six fletch. I've seen uh, John Dudley fletch up some stuff like that yeah, and play around with it. It's okay. I've got a four fletch. These guys have three. Three, yeah. Three. I don't have enough time in a day to fletch four. <laughs> <laughs> I got a really strong helical on my arrows for those of you who've been watching. I've got the Easton Carbon Injection Deep Six. It's a 330 spine, four millimeter, I believe. Yeah, so the smaller diameter. And a carbon, a white carbon RX3, shooting the black gold three pin uh, slider sight. I always set up my pins as 30, 40, 50, 50 being my floater. And I got the Carter release, just like BMAC. I think I have like a Hoyt brand stabilizer and the rest, fall away rest. All right, hopefully that answered your questions on archery setup. Okay, we're gonna wrap it up with one final question. Uh, comes from our Facebook page, Colton Brewer. Favorite state to hunt and why? To start. To start. Yeah. So Utah, home state, grew up, uh, Everything I learned growing up was all from hunting with my dad in Utah. There's a specific area where he grew up that's special to me that I hunted my first, not, I didn't shoot my first deer, but I think my second, my third, and my fourth deer I shot on that mountain. So for many reasons, Utah is my favorite place to hunt just because I think I get to learn it more and more, hunt it every single year. Mine's pretty easy right now in Colorado uh, for mule deer. I mean, you got everything under the sun from places like this in the Alpine for archery, amazing muzzleloader opportunities. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people overlook second season rifle for deer, like there's a lot of great opportunities there, great weather, a lot of public land. Like you could drop pins on Colorado and boom, it's gonna be a giant deer somewhere in Colorado. Uh, so my favorite nostalgic place to hunt would be where I grew up hunting with my dad in Eastern Oregon in the Blues Mountain Range. But probably my favorite place that I've hunted is the Gila National Forest down in New Mexico. Just a special, special place to chase elk with your bow during the rut. Had a lot of great memories there. Um, and it's ultimately where I met Casey, which kind of turned into Hush years later. So it holds a special place for me as well. Uh, Wyoming, I would say, just for the variety. You can hunt mule deer, antelope, uh, elk. Uh, phenomenal hunting throughout that state. Uh, favorite place I ever hunted though would probably be Kodiak Island. So for blacktail, you just 
I mean, you feel like you're just disconnected from the world when you're up there. It's just so wild and just new. So for me, that'd probably be like my favorite spot. Idaho, like uh, Brian said, that's where I grew up hunting with my dad. And that's kind of where I learned a lot of the things I know today. But uh, also because it's a very opportunistic state. And I tell a lot of people this, which I shouldn't, but uh, we're in all about inspiring other people to get out and do it. Idaho, you can hunt archery, deer, and elk pretty much 70% of the state every year, which is awesome. And like I said earlier, if you just start figuring out one unit over and over and over and keep hunting and hunting it, your, your success rate is going to go way up because you know it. And like we were saying earlier, you know the terrain, you know what the animals do. So I think that's very important if you're looking to have success. All right, guys, that is going to wrap up the question and answer with Brady Trail. We're here at Go Hunt once again. Let us know if you guys enjoy this format. It's a little bit different than what we've done before, but uh, we certainly have always tried to do our best at responding to emails, direct messages, etc. This was a little bit better formatted to try to answer some of the most common questions. And uh, if you want to do uh, us a favor, leave a comment if you like it, and we will do our best to do another round of this. Answering even more questions about anything you can imagine and think of uh, pertaining to hunting, maybe even some fishing, but mostly hunting. <laughs> so the final thing is make sure you guys join the 30-day free trial for the Go Hunt Insider platform. We referenced a lot of the resources and data that is available within that throughout the question and answers. And then also, if you recall, there will be five winners, $500 each that we'll announce beginning of September for uh, money towards the Go Hunt gear shop. They have a ton of cool stuff there. Guarantee you will blow through that 500 very easily. Yeah guys, just once again, well, I just wanna tell you, we've said it over, if you've watched our, our Go Hunt videos we've done this summer, literally all these questions can be answered through the Go Hunt, Hunt Insider program. All that data has been compiled and it is at the tips of your fingertips once you sign up. So make sure, like Brian said, you go and try it out for the free 30 day trial we'll leave the link in the description box so click it try it out you will not what's the word I'm looking for be disappointed you will not be disappointed <laughs> it's a big one that's a wrap